welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you all have come along. I have an exciting program today, and I'm, I can't wait to share it with you, really, because we needed to continue to talk about things that are important in the life of the general evangelical Wesleyan movement. And that's generally the people who are in my audience, and I think we can learn a lot from what's going on in the United Methodist Church. But before we do that, I want you to know that this podcast is sponsored by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. That means that we believe there are churches out there that are looking for biblically orthodox leaders who are trained in the consensual tradition of the church. And we want to ensure that those leaders are prepared to serve. And this means that we have a variety of programs from uh, bachelor's and pastoral ministry, master's degree, master of divinity, doctorate of ministry. And we also have a several lay initiatives, including the Wesley Institute, which starts this September. So you can go to wbs.edu to find out more about that. Also, we're really thankful for Bill Roberts, a financial planner who comes at that discipline from the perspective of a Christian worldview. And he helps people really plan for their retirement, particularly people who are serving in ministry as they to think about housing allowances and all those type of things. So I just encourage you to check out Bill Roberts. You can find a link to him in my show notes. And finally, I'm Glad as people are getting geared up for the fall season, was a new small groups are starting in Sunday school classes. My study of the book of Jude, a six part study of this little book, um, is so important. I think it's been something that's been important to be able to put out. It has six sessions with more than five hours of content helping believers contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So you can check that out at my website at andymillerthe3rd.com. That's andymillerii.com. Now, on to our program. I'm so excited to welcome in a Reverend Rob Renfro, who serves as a president of Good News for United Methodists and is a retired elder in the United Methodist Church in the Texas Conference. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, and it's a real joy to be here uh, with you. I am recently retired. Recently, and, recently. Yeah, just a few months, and I tell people with all that's going on in the United Methodist Church and all the things we're trying to do to help churches all over the country, I tell people if I wasn't retired, I couldn't work this hard. God. So, oh, oh, forgive me. I, I bet that was really hard to hear that word, retired. With your, <laughs> no, I've yeah. been looking forward to it. I've needed a little more balance in my life, and even with all that's going on, not having that constant pressure that pastors face of having prepared messages as well as you know, giving pastoral care and uh, running a church, it's really been, um, it's it's been good for me to slow down a bit, but things are, we're going to get into it, things are really going on in the United Methodist Church right now, and uh, we're, we're at a place that we needed to be, we didn't get here the way that we should have gotten here, but there's a yeah. lot of work to do, and we're excited about what God is doing, birthing this new global Methodist church. Right. Well, I'm, I've been so encouraged by you through the years. I have uh, my family is very connected to United Methodist Renewal. And I you don't know it, but I've read your articles. I've right. watched YouTube videos of you. And I'm, I, I admire your courage. And I'm just really honored to get a chance to talk to you. I remember even hearing one of the first messages I heard you present was one where you talked about um, just knowing that you were going into a bit of a battle for right. orthodoxy. And I know some people might even be resistant to the fact that I'm saying that that's a reality that we enter into yeah. battle. But you said something about um, in eternity, the, uh, I can't remember how it quite goes, showing your scars, like where are yeah. your scars? Yeah. And I think that there's something uh, pow powerful about that, that we are going to have, and in part, I've been really, I've been studying the book of Jude a lot lately. Yeah. And there's this interesting thing like where he said, I, I intended to write to you about something else, the yeah. salvation we share, but I had to call you to contend for the faith, which in a sense is I had to call you to get into the fight. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I was really excited when I heard you announce that you've done this series on Jude. That may be the most relevant book of the New Testament to where we are uh, right now. And it is so interesting because people are uh, really denying uh, who Jesus is. They right. have adopted what today we would call a progressive sexual ethic. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's interesting. They're that those who are undermining the message of the church are referred to as these dreamers. 
right. you know, their, their sense of authority are their dreams, their personal experiences, their imaginations, their sense that God is doing a new thing, that the Holy Spirit is revealing something new. Right. And when you ask, well, how do you know this? Well, I have this dream. I have this feeling. So it, it's funny, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Oh, and man. So, right what uh, they were dealing with in the early church is exactly what we're dealing with here and it's really interesting we try to be gracious to people who see things differently but man in that book the names that those who are undermining the faith are called uh, you you would probably get blocked on social media oh if yeah you use those terms to describe people who are undercutting orthodoxy today yeah jude the brother of jesus would certainly be canceled oh, oh, he would certainly oh, oh. be canceled <laughs> yeah but and the, the, uh, it, i like how you highlighted he, he, he says they do this on the authority of their dreams yeah i mean this is clearly taking our experiences yeah. and exalting them and that's exactly where you know where we are well we, we can talk about this as long as you want i don't want to keep you from what you want to get into no, that's good. but that that is exactly right you know what is the basis of our authority and as you said um jude says contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints and that was the faith that Jesus taught, that the apostles taught, and that was revealed in the Old Testament. That was the faith once and for all uh, delivered to the saints. And they were uh, on the basis of their inner feelings and, and their, their self-generated beliefs. We're, we're saying God's doing something new. He's giving us a revelation that um, overrides, maybe even right. contradicts what has been revealed in the past and that is exactly when you talk with uh, progressives and even centrist in the United Methodist Church, God's doing something new. He's revealing. Well, how do you know that? Yes. Well, I just I just feel that he is. I mean, it, these are like new Gnostics. They yeah, have absolutely. Uh, enlightened knowledge that the rest of us poor folks who just read the Bible and trust the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what has been uh, told to us in the past, they have this knowledge that goes beyond anything that we mere mortals have been made privy to. Right. And um, man, oh man, when your sense of authority is your feelings, your dreams, your sense, um, that should really set bells off that, that you are in great danger of wandering away from the faith once and for all delivered to the same. Yeah, those words are incredibly powerful. The faith once for all delivered. Two, yes. two real quick. I could talk about Jude for a long time, Me but, I, I, but I, 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 maybe we should. The the <laughs> first thing is uh, Michael Green, the apologist. He uh, wrote commentary at the beginning of his career academically, and then at mm -hmm. the end, toward the uh -huh. end of his career, on Jude and Second Peter. And he says, um, uh, he has this long list of sins and. Um, heresies and he says as long as these things remain the letter of jude will remain uncomfortably burningly relevant <laughs> and then the other one is uh even though i don't i couldn't really find like how that how he made this claim so it's, it's not a good academic substantiation but he says um uh william barclay says that he believes that in period this is encouraging in periods of revival mm. the book of jude is often rediscovered wow is that interesting? Yeah, and so and here you and I are talking. I mean, obviously you've studied it. And then um, uh, I, I know Seedbed has another book coming out on Jude. I have this uh, six-week study. And I think that Whip and Sock also has a, a study of Jude coming out. Well, so. you, you don't need me to give you a recommendation, but y'all get into this study. You are <laughs> you're going to really appreciate having a basis for understanding what's going on in our culture and our church and how we can be people who are gracious, but at the same time, we can do what God tells us to do, and that is to contend for the faith. And, and, and we'll get off of it after this. But what's interesting is that book is not uh, addressed to the leaders or the teachers or the pastors mm. of the churches that he was writing. It, it's addressed to all believers. You yes. are supposed to know the faith. You're supposed to be able to defend it. You're supposed to understand when it's being undermined and when it's under attack. And you are expected to step up. Yeah. and be a champion of the faith once and for all delivered to the uh, to the saints. So that's not just our job. It's everybody's job. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm so excited to talk more about Jude. I'm going to, anybody who's listening to this, I'm going to have 10 people. I'm going to make, give 50% off of my, um, my, my study. So for a small group, you get, you, if you do it for a small group, you get five right. videos. 
and the discount code is going to be Rob, R-O-B. Oh, I love 10 it. 10 people, 10 people. <laughs> you get it. We'll see if anybody does it, but uh, okay. So I'm going to make that. All right. So Rob, tell us before, yeah. I, I'd, like, I'd like to hear just a little bit about you before you got into uh, yeah. good news. What led you there and, and how did you arrive at this place? Well, I, I'll take you way back. I grew up in a United Methodist Church. I was confirmed at the age of 12 and, um, and was in church all the time, went to Sunday school, parents raised me in church. And I would say uh, it was kind of a typical Methodist church. And by that, I mean, what I heard is the point of uh, Christianity is to help make us better people. And because of Jesus, we're supposed to uh, be good and, and be kind and be moral. Mm. What I didn't really hear was the offer of a personal relationship with Jesus. What I yeah. didn't hear was, uh, you know, that basic message that all have sinned, all have fallen short, all of us need to confess our need for a Savior, et cetera. And uh, I'll make this real simple. This was interesting that I in high school, begin to ask spiritual questions. And one question was, how can I be certain that I'm going to go to heaven when right. I, I die? And um, I didn't really know. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, I've got to be a really good person. And then I was also thinking about college and heard great news. And that was at college that they graded on the curve. College was really, really hard. Okay. And you, um, but you didn't have to make a hundred. You didn't have to make a ninety to get an A. You just had to beat out most of the other students, <laughs> yeah. which was really good because uh, I had no athletic ability. I was pencil necked, and so I had no romantic life. So I had a lot of time to study, and I always did really well in school. So I thought I'm going to be okay. I I just need to be you know work harder, be better than the other students when I go to college. So that kind of translated over in my mind. Now you can listen how crazy this is. So the way that it worked in my spiritual life was, well, we know nobody's going to make a hundred on God's mm. test. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be perfect. Sure. So how can I be certain I'm going to go to heaven? Well, God's obviously going to have to curve up, right? Because nobody's going to make a hundred. Nobody's right, you know, right. going to get that close. So really all I've got to do is beat out the others. I just got to yeah. be out the others, you know, who are competing with me for going to heaven. I don't know if you have to make top 80%, top 10%. What do you got to do? Yeah. But, and then I started looking around at the competition. I looked around at other teenagers. They were drinking, smoking, sexing, some were <laughs> stealing, cursing. I didn't do any of those things. I thought, and, and that was just our church youth group. Okay. <laughs> and so I thought, I think I'm going to be okay. You know, yeah. God takes the top 20%. I really feel like I'm good. Top 10%. I still feel like I'm going to be all right. Not realizing that spiritual pride, which I was guilty of, is the greatest of all sins because it keeps you from acknowledging uh, your sinfulness, your need for saviors, the idea that, you know, you can save yourself. Uh, ultimately, the only thing that can really keep you from out of the kingdom. So then by God's grace, we had a summer youth director that back i'm old enough that we didn't really have youth pastors we had summer right. youth directors who came and this guy was nothing in the world like we wanted he was so straight and i won't go into all of that and we thought oh my gosh you know we didn't get somebody who's cool no and, fine uh, yeah yeah i could describe him but um but it took me a few weeks just a few weeks to realize that this guy knew god wow and i did not wow now how i knew that I don't know, but I could see it. Mm. And the only thing I'll say to my credit is that uh, when I saw the real thing, I recognized it and I mm. wanted it for myself. Mm -hmm. I was a little older than most of the kids in the youth group. I was working at a, a restaurant at night, so I didn't get to do all the things that they did that summer. But I came a few weeks later and I remember they were singing um, and I could see now that those kids knew God. Mm, and I wow. did those bad kids that were yeah, drinking yeah, and the, smoking you and were cursing. Better than, yeah. Yeah. And I remember it was like, God, this is not right. Okay. I haven't done any of the things they've done. I've been the good kid and I don't know you. How did these bad kids get to that? Wow. So I spoke with Eddie. His name was Eddie Wills. We'll be forever grateful. And 
in pretty much so many words, Eddie said, Rob, there's a difference between being a good kid and being God's kid. Wow. And even good kids have sins that they need to repent of, ask forgiveness for, and they need a savior. And so he led me to uh, pray to receive Christ as my Lord and savior. And so then um, I, I began to have this personal relationship with Jesus. So this is finally ties in with your question. That's no, good. Yeah. So immediately I began to understand that there are many good folks in United Methodist churches that were never hearing this basic message of you need a savior. You're here not just to be a good person, yes. but you're here to be in personal relationship with Jesus that then, you know, moves you forward into everything that the Christian life is. And so that was part of my calling. I, I wished that I had a lightning bolt, you know, and I kept waiting and praying uh, for that. But finally, my call, this is like the wimpiest call story ever. <laughs> my call was, God, I don't know what preachers do. And I don't know if I can do it well. But I know there are a lot of people in the United Methodist Church that need to come to know Jesus. So unless you stop me, that's wow. what I'm going to do. And wow. then, you know, God confirmed that uh, along the way. So uh, and it, it's really interesting, Andy, at the very same time that I knew that I wanted to tell people about Jesus, God put in my heart that I was supposed to do something to help our denomination. That those were two yeah. calls early, early that came almost simultaneously. I got to tell people about Jesus and man, this denomination that has such a great history, uh, such a great heritage, this needs help. And so I went into the ministry, immediately began to uh, have opportunities to speak and invite people into a relationship with Christ. And then I began to have opportunities to work not only in what we call our annual conference, our part of Texas, but then nationally to uh, help our denomination uh, become grounded and rooted in that faith once and for all delivered to the saints that we were uh, talking about. Wow, it's so interesting. Like you, you wouldn't have probably known at the time what right. that what that call. You say it's like not yeah. that significant of a call, like or not that uh, dramatic or whatever. But boy, that has been lived out by your life. I mean, mm -hmm. who would have known that in that moment? And you thought I'm just sharing with a uh, United Methodist, but right. that that very specific call is unique now one thing would be helpful i think for my audience many okay. would already united methodists uh would understand the nature of the structure but i think a lot of people who are outside that system maybe who come from a congregational system yeah or my you know my tradition is the salvation army which is more of a, a military system right. don't understand the nature of what you just said with conference like a conference yeah. some people might think oh i go to a conference that happens on a weekend <laughs> right but tell tell us about the a little bit of the political structure of the United well, it gets says, it gets yeah. very complicated uh, yeah. more complicated than it needs to be so the basic building block organizationally is what's called the annual conference this comes from wesley's time and wesley would call all of his preachers together once a year for an annual conference uh they were uh, at the early days circuit riders and then when they came over to the colonies you know it covered a big geographical area but they would come together once a year for an annual conference. They would give a report on all the work they had done. Then they would have time of worship. They would have time of teaching and even theological debate. And it was a very uh, enriching time. So as here in the US, as Methodism expanded with the you know, colonies and then with the growing uh, United States, um, it became impossible for all of the Methodist pastors to come together geographically once a year. And so they began to break up into different annual conferences. And so in the state of Texas, for example, we have five annual conferences because we're a big state and we have a lot of uh, Methodists. Up in New England, all the New England states together are one annual conference, small gotcha. geographical area, smaller number. Now, in addition uh, to that, uh, we get together United Methodists all over the world. And right. interestingly, about 40% of United Methodists now live in Africa. Awesome. Um, so we come all together once every four years for what's called a general conference. And that's where we 
debate, uh, how we're going to live together, what our positions are going to be on different issues, and um, kind of that, that's where all of our, well, not all, but a good deal of the battles that we've had to fight to keep the church uh, orthodox, that's where they have gone on. So, so there's a form of democracy within, you know, you know, yeah, I met, there's not like pure democracy, but there is yeah. this governing body yeah. that functions at this the general conference level. And then that's handed over to bishops to, and, and people to implement yeah. and be executives of that. Is that right? Yeah. So each annual conference has a bishop. Okay. And so, uh, uh, you know, a bishop should be a, a shepherd. The real task is to uh, teach uh, our, our doctrines and to protect our discipline to make certain that people follow the rules of our church. Um, very often it becomes an administrative task. It can be an overwhelming job, but the, the issue, part of the issue is as the church has drifted further and further away from orthodoxy, um, we have bishops who do not um, uphold our, our classic Christian faith. Right, uh, they're right. much more liberal, much more progressive. And um, I could go into it if we get, uh, it would get complicated and maybe That's confusing. Fine. But we have a very difficult time holding our bishops accountable. They right. are accountable to each other. And they, in particular, are accountable to other bishops in a particular geographical area. So when an entire area becomes progressive, the bishops who are supposed to hold another bishop accountable all believe the very same thing. So, for example, though our uh, book of discipline, which is, I, I hate calling it a rule book, but which tells us what we've agreed on, how we're going to live together, yeah. uh, says that uh, we do not ordain practicing gay persons, okay, if you're actively gay yeah. uh, in a relationship or intend to be, we don't or ordain you and we don't marry gay persons. Church right. is open to all, welcoming of all, believe every person has sacred worth, don't believe that uh, the practice of homosexuality is any worse a sin than, than any of our other sins. But we have a married lesbian bishop. Right. So you would say, how is that possible? Well, we elect bishops by geographical areas. And so she was elected out west while she was married. And then the other bishops who affirm this uh, liberalized sexual ethic, they consecrated her as a bishop when they shouldn't have. Our Supreme Court, which is called the Judicial Council, said, hey, Bishop Shaw shouldn't do that. We need you to go back and undo it. And that was several years ago. And they have just thumbed their nose at uh, our Judicial Council's ruling. And there's no way to hold them accountable. So that's part of our problem. That's why we've come to this point of needing separation. We've lived with different opinions for really literally 50 years. Yes. But now we have different practices and we have no way to hold bishops accountable. Let me say one other thing. Then yeah, you yeah, it's good. Question. We often talk about sexuality. That's the presenting issue. Right, right, but right. The, the deeper issues is that the United Methodist Church, our pastors, our bishops, our lay people are deeply divided about whether or not the Bible is God's word. Right. And actually, uh, it's hard to say and hard to hear and maybe hard to believe. We're actually very divided on who Jesus is, right. whether he is the way, the truth, and the life, uh, where he is uh, that name by which all men and women must be saved, or whether he's just one of many options. Wow. So sexuality gets all the press because that's what we vote on. But the real issues are the deeper uh, issues about the scriptures and about who Jesus is. And then our bishops not enforcing our policies and our doctrines, but allowing everyone to do what's right in their own eyes. Wow, that is such a great short summary. And I know it takes Thank a while you. to get there, but that's in part what we're dealing with. And, and really, it's a doctrinal issue as you're talking, like when you're talking about scripture, it's not just like some people would call 
the conservative, you know, orthodox group, biblicist. But yeah. it's more about, I think, revelation, like the doctrine yeah. of that God has indeed revealed himself clearly so that we can know him. So like right. revelation, uh, I think creation is another doctrine that's not understood. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear you bring up the Christological point as well, that this really is like talking about the nature of who Jesus is. And that might even then, I, I'm not saying that everybody who would be on a different side than you would not affirm the resurrection, right. but I attended um, um, a, a United Methodist seminary in the uh, liberal direction. And I remember being in a classroom where I was the only person in the class who believed that Jesus was um, physically raised from the dead. So, Andy, Andy, listen, I uh, this has come to a head in the United Methodist Church. I have put out six videos that okay. kind of break it all down. And the response from, quote, centrist and progressives is, uh, Rob, you're just cherry picking. We don't know anybody who doesn't believe in the resurrection. We don't know anybody who doesn't believe in the virgin birth. <laughs> and either they don't get out much <laughs> or they're not telling the truth. Because what you just said, as shocking as it seems, that that's reality. We have United Methodist pastors who don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus, and they make it known, and no one says anything. We had, there's this, whenever I want to punish myself, I go on to Facebook, the UM clergy Facebook page, and read what's there. Um, you know, man, if, if the Catholics want us to do penance, that would be a good <laughs> way of punishing it yourself. And on Good Friday, you know, Methodist pastor went on to that Facebook page and wrote a long diatribe about why he does not believe that God sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. Mm -hmm. That this is an odious doctrine, it makes God into a monster, et cetera, et cetera. And others just pile on. Thank you for saying the truth. Thank you for telling what needs to be told, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, when others, especially the centrist who want to say, oh, you guys, you're cherry picking, you're just, uh, you know, you find a few outliers and then you, you know, expand and act like we're in real trouble. Here's I, unsolicited. Here you are saying, no, at seminary, I'm the only one in the room who actually believes in, in what is the <laughs> um, most important Christian truth. That yes. Jesus Christ was, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then your faith is in vain, right? Right. And so, uh, yeah, we've got not only all these problems, we've got folks who just deny the reality of where we are and are telling all of our people, everything's okay. And in the future, everything will be okay. Just let those traditionalists leave and then we can all live together in peace. And of course, there have always been prophets who've told God's people, peace, peace. Right. When there, when there is, when, when there is now, no it's interesting. Peace. You bring up the idea of centrist. Now, this is a helpful thing because what I've found to be interesting is that often, and this isn't just like in the United Methodist Church, of course, like uh, just so you know, like part of my angle is a lot of my audience is connected to Salvation Army. And right. we are about 40 years behind the United Methodist Church mm -hmm. and, on, on these discussions. And what happened, we have a we have something that kind of ace up our sleeve, so to speak, is that we have this autocratic system where yeah. there's one international leader who can enforce the rea the the doctrine. Now that those people, that person has to do that, and we'll right. see if that happens. But there are always people who say, "Well, I, I there there's these extremes." Andy, I'm I'm in the center. You are obviously way out to the right, and there yeah. are people way out to the left. Yeah. But let's just try and. Let's just agree to disagree and let's all right. get along. Um, what's the problem with that, Rob? Well, I once wrote a little article and I commended the quote centrist. I said, hey, guys, really great job of naming yourself. OK, because <laughs> you sound so reasonable and you immediately have marginalized me and others who hold, hold to the Orthodox Christian faith. I said, you're not at the center of what the Bible teaches. You're not at the center of 2000 years of Christian teaching. You're not at the center of the global Christian church. Just because you are between two groups that are willing to admit their differences and fight it out, just because you're between the two of us, that doesn't put you at the center of anything except a fight. Right. And it means you're finding a way to duck it. 
So I, but, but good job on calling yourself a centrist. So, you know, the, the question is there, there's, there's substance and there's whether I call it spirit or style, what do you believe? Mm. And there can be people who have an orthodox faith who just don't have, this sounds pejorative. I don't mean it. They don't have um, a heart for the fight. Mm -hmm, okay sure. it's just their nature how do we connect you know i always say that there's um I, I wrote a book called the trouble with the truth and i i try to talk about how jesus combined grace and truth and we're supposed to do that and some of us are gracers by nature and some mm -hmm. of us are truthers by nature mm -hmm. and you know if you're a truther by nature you got to be really careful because yeah. truth can really be brutal if that's all that it is. One example I've heard is, you know, salt, we're supposed to be salt of the earth, salt is uh, sodium uh, chloride. And chlorine, truth by itself, yeah, it's good at cleaning things up, okay? Yeah. But yeah. it's got this pungent odor, and if you get too much of it undiluted, it can kill you, okay? Mm. So, you know, the, a, a great saying is, uh, the person who's brutally honest enjoys the brutality quite as much as the honesty, okay? Oh, and that's not who we are to be. Right. Okay. Right. So truth by itself can really be brutalizing and hurtful. But the gracers, they're like the sodium. And what's interesting about sodium is that you never find it alone in, in nature. It always has combined with something. Mm. And so gracers, you know, they want to combine, they want to connect, they want to reach out and bring people close. And they think, you know, if only people knew how much they were loved, if they only knew that we love them, if only that God loved them, then they would straighten up and believe the best uh, for themselves. But the problem is when your nature is to connect, you sometimes lack that discernment that says, wait a second, I, I can connect with people, but not connect or accept uh, wrong beliefs and wrong practices, lifestyles. And so we need each other, okay? And uh, you know, if, if you don't have a heart for sinners, whatever the sin is, maybe you don't need to speak your truth because you're probably gonna do it in a way that's hurtful and gonna mm -hmm. push somebody further away. But if you don't have discernment, if you're not willing to stand up for the truth because you so love everybody and don't want anybody's feelings to be hurt, don't think that you're some special, wonderful Christian. You're just lacking in courage, okay? You're, you're yeah. just unwilling to say what needs to be said. And sometimes the most loving thing in the world that you can do is tell the truth. That's why I'm going to get off this rant in a minute, but that's why Jesus tells the woman, neither do I condemn you, then truth, go and sin no more. You, right. you remember the guy that was uh, paralyzed for 38 years near the pool? Okay, Jesus, you know, Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? And he starts making these excuses. I can't get because nobody will. And Jesus yeah. just said, oh, heck, man, get up, get your mat, move on. And so he heals the guy, gives him grace. This is, this is good. Then just a couple hours later, Jesus runs this guy down in the temple. He's having the first good day of his life in 38 years. And what does Jesus say to him? stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Wow. It's like, Jesus, let the guy have a few good minutes, you know? That's right. But, but Jesus says, here's the truth, man. You think you had it bad there by that pool for 38 years? Straighten up, or that's going to be a day in the park compared to what eternity is going to be wow. for you. So Jesus combined grace and truth and we don't get to choose to be truthers only or gracers only. If we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to bring the two together. Awesome. I love that, bringing together grace and truth. Now, you're part of your movement that you're you're the president of Good right. News for United Methodist. Right. Um, is it has a tradition of that could you i know this could be a whole show in itself could you outline a little bit about the history of what the good news group is yeah so the good news uh was begun in the late 60s uh by united methods pastor and journalist by the name of chuck kaiser and um he saw even then that the united methodist church was drifting theologically and politically, because the church in the past was even much more involved politically. In the past, United Methodist it's Church, hard to believe, but yeah. our, well, our boards and agencies were proclaiming that some of the uh, leftist, even communist revolutions going on in right. Africa were part of God's kingdom breaking in and liberating people. I mean, it was really, really wild. 
And so he saw this and he talked to the editor of the main Methodist newspaper and said, nobody speaks up for what I and many people believe. And so he said, well, why don't you write an op-ed? Okay, and so he did. And the reaction to that was uh, really positive by many uh, Methodists, United Methodists, who felt like nobody was speaking up for them. And that did two things. First of all, it meant that those, whether we call them evangelical, some people are comfortable with that word, some people aren't. Um, I don't mean it politically, but theologically. Right, right, right. Um, they thought, I may not have to leave. So this happened a long while ago, and so a core of evangelical Methodists were able to stay put rather than thinking it's hopeless and I've got to run off. So they began to hold conferences, um, not the annual conferences that we're right, talking right. about, but like gatherings, and people were greatly encouraged. And then they started to realize that they could organize politically and have some impact on what our policies uh, were. And so good news began to lead the way in that regard. Now, there've been other um, traditional uh, evangelical renewal movements that have come for different reasons, all good. Confessing movement is a, a really good one. Uh, there's another group called UM Action uh, that we're grateful for. Um, but we have worked uh, together, um, all these different groups. And so over time, what has happened is good news. We try to do a good job of actually telling good stories that are going on in the United Methodist Church. We want to celebrate what God is doing, and there's much that is really good uh, yes. here in the U.S. and certainly all around the world. We're very, very grateful for that. Um, we put out a, a magazine uh, six times a year, and our editor, Steve Beard, does a spectacular job of getting those stories out. But we also have felt that it's our ministry to highlight where there is unfaithfulness going on and to hold those in places of leadership uh, accountable. And then, uh, along with these other groups, but I would say good news more than any other group, has been the driving force organizing uh, traditional delegates that go to general conference. Uh, so many of those, about a third of those come from Africa, others come from the Philippines, Eastern Europe, other places, and we build a coalition along with our evangelical uh, delegates from the United States to go to general conference, be prepared to try to uh, maintain our biblical views. So when they go when, at general conference, this is not a simple process. Like this is a very and, and, and there can be bureaucracies that are used well. So I don't mean yeah. it in a negative way that there, yeah. there's, but it's a bureaucratic system using Robert's rules of orders. It's yeah. a complicated thing as I've tried to tune in or like even follow yeah. the news as you have these things. So there's a way that you help people understand what's going on. Because the people who are going are yeah. lay, lay leaders in their church or business yeah. people. Like I, I have a, a friend who, you know, he owned Hallmark stores in South Georgia yeah. and he helped to lead the right. South Georgia conference on the lay side. And then there's people yeah. who are um, a part of it from another perspective where they are, um, they're, they're pastors. Like, and they're, yeah. they're concerned about what sermon series am I going to do next? <laughs> exactly. what, what's the stewardship campaign going to be like? Right. So the, a part of what you do then, or what, what, Good news is it help people right. know what's going on so they can yeah. be attuned to these systems. Yeah, delegates, there's uh, roughly 860 these days. That number fluctuates a little bit. They get books this thick. Wow. Of all the proposed changes to our, what we call our book of discipline, all these proposed legislative changes. Many of them are very small, some of them are terribly important. So our team, particularly Tom Lambrecht, who works uh, with me, um, he goes through all of that. He, he reads through what are the big issues that need to be addressed. Uh, he and others then write position papers. We get all of that out to delegates. Uh, we've begun hosting a two to three day pre-conference with African delegates. Mm. Uh, you know, they come from far away. They need time to adjust to the new time zone. They need to um, understand a little bit about how we do things, Robert's rules or all those kinds of things. And then we try to make certain that 
our evangelical U.S. delegates, as well as uh, Africans and people from other countries that we're all on the same page and that we have our strategy worked out. I mean, it's a political event and some people think that's terrible, but anytime you have people together trying to figure out how they're gonna order themselves, it's that's the nature, that's political. And it's just that whether you do it with integrity or not. So yeah, we uh, every four years, it is a huge undertaking um, and, but we are, we may want to shift and start talking about where we are now yes, exactly. that's what I was thinking, yeah. beyond that point that that's, that has kept the United Methodist church as the only mainline denomination that has even at this time, a biblical position regarding sexuality, right. uh, PC USA, the Episcopal church USA, um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, strange name for a group as liberal as it is, the UCC, all of them have liberalized their sexual ethics and all of the evangelicals have had to leave. We're the only denomination because of all of that good work, but because of the uh, unwillingness of our bishops to hold people accountable, because uh, I would say rebellion or disobedience is rampant uh, we've come to a, a place where we believe that just having the right position uh, is no longer sufficient and that we need a, a separation. So that's finally like what's happened. It's like, so we, we, my audience might be, if we were aware of what the protocol is, we had Keith Boyette on and had a nice conversation right. with him about this. So like, so now we've come to a place where this was, this was put in place two years ago in 2020, where there was this agreement of what was going to happen. But now t tell us, Rob, what's happened? Like, because it's like, uh, we're looking forward to this time yeah. where there would be a general conference and there would be as the words right. were from, if, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was former, uh, uh, in Houston, um, uh, Bill Henson said, yeah. uh, amicable separation. Like right. he said this way back in two, yeah. 2002 or some 2004, like, okay, yeah. this is the time. And oh, yeah. that's too soon. That's too soon. We can't, we can't do that. No, no. But now it's, it's come. And unfortunately mm -hmm. this, it's not being as amicable if I'm saying that word correctly. No, no, it's not. And so I, I won't go through it all, but we've had fight after fight after fight. And yeah. then we called a special general conference in 2019 to say, let's solve this once and for all. Let's have a special conference. We don't talk about anything else. We'll prepare for it. People will have uh, made their uh, proposals and then we'll vote and we'll be done with it. So that happened. And again, the traditional position, all people are people of sacred worth. All people are accepted in our churches, but we don't ordain or marry practicing gay persons. That was again upheld. And then uh, I'm trying to think of a phrase that I can say all, all heck broke out. <laughs> That's right. And what happened is that we'd all agreed we're going to solve this once and for all. But once the centrist and the liberals didn't get their way, they immediately began to repudiate what the general conference had uh, agreed to. Full page ads were taken out by pastors right. and lay people condemning this action, condemning the United Methodist Church. And long story short, uh, 26 of our, I believe 53 annual conferences have all gone on record repudiating this. 12 of them have said, we're just going to ignore it. We're going to go on and do what we think is right. And, and we're not going to hold anybody accountable if they break this uh, book of discipline. So it was like, oh my gosh, here we are. You know, we, we trusted these folks to be good faith partners. They won't do it. And then miraculously, a bishop from Africa called together some leaders. I was part of the first meeting and said, let's see if we can't come up with something. And uh, I didn't think anything would come of it. But that's when the protocol that created a amicable, as you say, an amicable way of parting. Neither side thought it was really fair, which means probably mm. about as good as you could get. And this happened only because Kenneth Feinberg, a world-class um, mediator, I mean, who's handled some of the biggest cases in history, graciously gave his time to come and to make mm. this happen. Um, so then we thought, okay, we're going to vote on this in um, May of uh, 2020. Then COVID came, so we couldn't meet. And then we thought, well, we would meet uh, again in 2022, and then we would meet this protocol. 
but the group that's in charge of setting dates and making it happen is called the Commission on General Conference announced earlier this spring that they were not going to hold general conference still because of COVID. Now, what's amazing is that half a dozen church bodies, the, the Episcopal Church, what we used to call our United Methodist Women, now Faith United, um, the, 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 the right now, the, the um, all of the bishops in the Anglican communion, all right, of these yeah, folks yeah. found a way to come together and have a meeting, but not the United Methodist Church. And what was obvious to us, and we have some inside information, is that this was a politically driven decision. It meant that the protocol would be pushed off another two years. Uh, new delegates would have to be elected. They would likely be more liberal than those who had been elected, and that this would be a way of uh, stalling and of discouraging uh, evangelicals. So um, what we decided is that many traditional Methodists could no longer live in their often abusive liberal annual conferences. And they cried out and said, we can't wait anymore. We can't wait another two years. Plus all of the liberal and progressive leaders who'd helped create the protocol, they yes. also sent out a letter saying, hey, we're not gonna support it anymore. Okay? Wow, I didn't and, know that, okay. Oh, oh yeah, so here, here it is. They put their names on it. They helped create it. They said, this is the way forward. But now that they believe that they have the upper hand, they've all you know, rescinded. Now they have reasons why that are just laughable. Uh, so uh, people said, no, we can't wait anymore. So on May 1st of this year, the Global Methodist Church was officially launched. It had yes. been ready to go for some time. Great work's been done in preparing the foundation for this new denomination. And so now we're in the process, because there is no protocol, uh, that every bishop pretty much gets to set his or her own terms for how churches can leave and go join the Global Methodist Church. Mm. And some are being relatively fair. Uh, others are being utterly abusive. Mm. Um, and so right now it's an exciting time because finally the separation is occurring. Uh, the church that I'm a part of, um, just retired from, uh, the Woodlands Methodist Church, our second largest church in the country, 14,000 members. Uh, we just voted by a 96 percent uh, in favor margin to leave to disaffiliate from mm -hmm. uh, the United Methodist Church, the second largest church in our annual conference, Faith Bridge, voted by 100 percent to leave. Wow. Uh, 220 churches in our annual conference, out of roughly 600, are already in a process of what's called discernment that will lead up to a time where they vote. So it's a, an exciting time because it's really happening. We're going to have a new thoroughly orthodox um, Methodist denomination, Western denomination, uh, but it's also a chaotic and difficult time because some churches are stuck. The amount of money that they are being required to pay to keep their property, this okay. trust clause that we have means you can't just leave and take your, your property with you. You have to pay your way out to the annual conference. And some are requiring the most ludicrous things you can imagine. People have paid for this church. They've built this church. They've labored for its ministries. And now they're being told, oh, to leave and take your property, uh, you've got to pay uh, up to 50% of what your property is worth. Oh, well, wow. churches don't have that right. money. They don't have those assets. They'd have to sell their building uh, and then give practically everything they get from it because you never get what your building's really worth. So that's our work right now, helping individual churches uh, all around the country find a way out. Mm. And does that mean that they go, they, it doesn't mean they necessarily go directly to the Global Methodist Church? Like, so yeah. your church, a very well-known church, yeah. um, has it then made a decision about being a part of the global methodist church or is that something that is the first step is disaffiliation there's two ways you can do it and churches yeah. are doing it both of these ways one is to know where you're going to land you really have a number of options you can be an independent church we don't recommend that i mean being wesley it means being connected right uh, sure. and, and being accountable 
but some are going independent and that's a possibility. Uh, most will go to the Global Methodist Church and then some others may find a different denomination. A few have chosen to go to the Free Methodist Church. And right. so there's, there's different options. So you can do it all at once, which some have done. You, you, others are taking two steps and that's what uh, the Woodlands Methodist is doing. But the first step is knowing we can't remain in the United Methodist Church. Right. Um, and that way the vote was simply on that issue. It, it's not about where are we gonna land? that mm -hmm. because in, in one way is you there's a lot of information to process so maybe you um make it less just keep the issue real clear here's the problems with the umc do you think we should stay or not no okay issue mm -hmm. done now here are our options for the future let's take some time to look at that and so that's the way that uh the church that i've been a part of is doing it and so we we just voted this last sunday to leave and so now we'll take some time to recommend where they should go. I, I hope and I suspect it will be the Global uh, Methodist uh, Church. But again, that'll be a decision that the congregation will make. So, Rob, I have some friends who you know went to seminary with or yeah. people who I've served with. And they, 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 some, some of them serve in liberal areas. And, and, and I think but every time I say the word liberal, or progressive. I know some people think I'm speaking in a pejorative way, yeah. but they just know like th this is the clearest term. If you need me to spend a half an hour to define what liberal or progressive means, mm -hmm. I can, and yeah. I'll do it in a generous way, but I'm not doing it here. I think you know what I mean. Rob and I have been talking about this for 45 yeah. minutes. So, well, they, they use these terms for themselves. Okay. So, so we're not, we're just in the way that you can call me a conservative. And I know you could mean that in a pejorative way. I would say, yeah, I'm a conservative Christian. So you're not being at all dismissive. You're just giving them the name that they've chosen themselves. Oh, that's helpful to me. I appreciate you yep. saying that, Rob. So, so some of my friends are ser serving those places and they might say, well, they have said to me, Andy, I've made a vow. I've made a vow to the United Methodist Church and I am just as conservative as you. I uphold a biblical sexuality, a biblical sexual ethic and authority of scripture. Um, but somebody's got to stay. You know, we've got to stay and fight. And we've got to be in a position where we can't just give it all away because what's going to happen um, to the church if, if all the conservatives leave? So there, there, there's some I feel like are so committed to the institution, even though their theology is more consistent with what yeah. the Global Methodist Church is or, yeah. or another Wesleyan denomination. Yeah. What's your word to those to, to my friends who are, who are saying those type they're trying to take that sort of stance at this point? Well, let's assume, and again, I'm not trying to be pejorative, let's assume that their motive for staying really is somehow a concern for the United Methodist Church and its renewal. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not doing anything because you've got to make hard decisions and you've got to do difficult things. And it's just easier to kind of say, well, I think we should stay and help. But let's assume that this is really their driving motive. Um, I would say, brother, you're involved in the charge of the light brigade, okay? Uh, we have fought for this for 50 years. And the way that the Methodist church is organized, the way that no one can hold the bishops accountable, the fact that you will never again elect a thoroughly traditional Orthodox United Methodist bishop. Once mm -hmm. we leave, even now with us here, we don't think we could do it. Once we wow. leave, you're never going to, um, elect a, a, a bishop who will defend the Orthodox Christian faith. As a matter of fact, once we leave, you're not going to see uh, anything, whether you call it evangelical, traditional, conservative pastors are not going to be ordained wow. in the United Methodist Church. So we have tried, we have fought the good fight for 50 years, literally 50 years. And we've come to this point where we believe that um, there's no hope to renew this uh, organization. Mm. And it's hard to say. Uh, in some ways, I think we fought the good fight. Uh, we have given a lot of hope and held a lot of uh, conservatives in this denomination who will now go be a part of something new together. In other ways, I think, you know, we fought and in some sense we lost. Uh, mm. The denomination decided that it wanted to uh, 
be uh, liberal in its sexual ethic, and it wanted to be open to what I would call heresy, the teachings that many pastors and bishops give about the scriptures, give about uh, yeah. Jesus, uh, are heretical. And uh, sometimes you just need to write Ichabod, you know, mm. the spirit of God <laughs> is departed and yeah, go leave. Yeah. I, 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 this sounds more pejorative than I mean it. Jesus said, um, you know, if you don't find a man of peace in that city, just Hi. dust off your sandals and leave. Wow. And that's where we are. And if you want to stay and fight and put your people through that, um, you want to fight, you want to be, have a contentious rest of your ministry, but go ahead, but you're not going to win. Wow. Rob, thank you for having the courage to say that. And we know that that's been a part of the tradition of good news is to be able to say hard things like we've outlined yeah. the grace and truth balance that you've you've highlighted. Here's what's interesting. I'd love, love for you to take a minute to, to talk to some other denominations. So I'm in my denomination, there's a, there's a slippage, I think, in this the exact same areas. Yeah. The polity is a little different. The public yeah. awareness is different. Um, then also I see it happening. I've, I've a lot of, we have friends, uh, other faculty members here who are part of the Nazarene church. And, um, unfortunately some of their institutions are yeah. letting go of the yeah. biblical orthodoxy as well. Uh, if you could, this, this is a tough, cause, cause I, I actually, I almost, I feel like pain for yeah. you and my United Methodist friends, as you say, in some senses we lost. Yeah. If you could go back this is a tough if you could go back now what would be would you would, would, would you did the right things according to the spirit at the time and i like i fully believe that but right. now seeing how people have not been good actors right what what would what would you have advised the united methodist church 20 years ago to do if you knew what you knew now if you know well um <laughs> It's, it's hard to say what, what we should have done. You mentioned Bill Henson, who I served on his staff at First Methodist in Houston, who I, I'll tear up, who I admired with all my heart yeah. and uh, was a hero of mine. Um, he, he said, we need to separate. We need to admit that we're two different tribes. Yeah. And um, I think it, it's difficult, Andy, because even now you say you have some friends who think I'm going to stay and fight. And so you have folks all different places in what they see in the future. We knew that Bill was right. Many of us knew that Bill was right. Mm -hmm. And that if we could have done anything, it would have said, let's stop the next 20 years of fighting and beating each other up. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually good news has argued that the way I've described it is we're in a cage match. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what cage matches and wrestling put some people in, you lock them in there and nobody leaves uh, until only one person can stand. And yeah. that person steps out bloodied and battered and beaten, but now he's the victor. And I've said, you know, let, let's stop the cage match. We can't quit fighting and we can't escape each other. Let's just stop this, open the door and we'll go our separate ways. But you had others, no, we gotta stay, we gotta fight. You had the other side that didn't want to compromise. So if we could have done anything differently, we would have found a way to separate long ago. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is even many good evangelicals weren't ready to do that. They yeah. thought they could fight and win, or they didn't see the problem um, being as difficult as it is. Um, I would say if you have um, faithful people in places of leadership, you need to go to them and you need to say, look at what has happened at every denomination that yes. has shown some slippage in the biblical position. It always is a downhill slide. Every denomination that is allowed, there's no stopping point for people on the left. Okay, you, you, we, and I'm getting us off, Andy, but but once your goal, once your altar is inclusivity, yes. what do you not include? Right. And, and people in the Methodist church who think, oh, all we want to do is make room for loving, monogamous, same-sex relations. Right. They've got no clue uh, right. of where this is going. Um, we, we had, and Duke, uh, Duke Divinity Schools, United Methodist School, we just had a service where students there, some of them United Methodists, uh, prayed to God as the great queer one. 
the holy and queer one. Uh, they prayed you were um, father, mother, uh, parent, sibling, trans man, drag queen. These are, th this is where this will go in the future. There's no stopping point. And the centrist who say, well, not on our watch, okay? Mm -hmm. They're gonna be overrun by these young progressives who have no stop for them, that it will continue to get further and further um, into very bizarre and, and really awful things. And we see that happen politically, uh, what's happening just in society, uh, uh, polyamory, yep. polygamy, and the yep. like. It's just, it's, and, and, and we we are told, like when Obergefell fell, oh, don't worry, just, we're, we'll, we'll be right. fine. This is all going to be just like, we just want this one thing. No, no, it, it's it's yep. clear that there is a, a like a case to destroy the institution yeah. of marriage and what yeah. it represents. And I would say that this is a pre-political institution. Now on, on the po political side, there's a different yeah. reason to support it, but yeah. within the life of the church, like yeah. you could see the exact same arguments happening. Well, and how are the centrists who tell us they're going to be on the watch? They're, they're trying to tell traditional right. Methodists, you can stay, nothing's really going to change. You're never going to be put in a place that you have to do anything you're uncomfortable with. We won't let it go to woke. Okay. Right, right. But how are they going to say marriage is only two people when they've already said that the first chapters of Genesis don't teach that it's one man and one woman? Then the next question is, well, how can you be certain it teaches just two people? Yeah, yeah. Because you use it to say, well, just love. Love is love. And as long as it's loving and committed. And if you, I know when people hear us talk like this, no, the church, the United Methodist Church will at some point be promoting um, polyamory, you know, yeah. more than uh, two people and some kind of committed, at least for a time, relationship, and they will bless this. And people say, you're, you're crazy. You're just an alarmist. Look, just think about where we are now and how in years past when we said, yeah, there's going to be, a, it, my parents, both of them died about three years ago. Mm. But if you told them, um, you know, when they were in their 40s, there's going to come a time when uh, gay people are going to be really open about it and uh, expect to be accepted. They say, oh, no, people wouldn't do that. Yeah. And there's going to come a time when uh, they're going to get married and our government's going to say that, that they would say, no, that's crazy. And now when you uh, tell them you're going to have United Methodist students praying to God as the great queer one, when you have at one of our seminaries in the chapel, a drag queen show mm -hmm. uh they would say that's bizarre well that's happening and so whenever you say here's the stopping point certainly it can't get any stranger than this i don't know what the next strange thing is going to be but yeah. i can promise you there is no stop on the left there's no right. place where they will say but we don't include that and it has a lot to do with the the ethos of our time that our inner feelings determine reality that our identity is not who we are in Christ, but it's these um, emotions, these feelings, this sense that we have about ourselves. And no one on the other side says, we love you, but you don't get to be crazy. Yeah. And so- uh, This is tough. I'm so yeah. sorry, Rob D. Like, let me offer one other argument I've heard recently. Okay. And there's an academic conference that's gonna come together, I think in Australia. Um, and it, it, I saw a paper proposal that is, like a critique of the global Methodist church. And the, the, the idea is academic presentation. And the idea is it doesn't embrace Wesley's Catholic spirit. Um, and then, and the same thing, the idea is like the historical case is being, is being made is that the, you have generated the 20th century was the ecumenical century, the coming together and represented by the term united, right? United. So you yeah. uniting and yeah. now you're no longer, it, it, we're no longer, we're just breaking into uh like the kind of the fissiparious nature of the church since the reformation yeah. and we're just embracing that and that's a problem g g give me just a and we've already addressed that a little bit but would you respond directly to that and i won't keep you too much longer but i just no, I, I think I'm this is a helpful piece well um first of all people who say that uh, churches like the Global Methodist Church don't embrace West, Wesley's Catholic spirit, you really wonder if they've read his sermon on Catholic <laughs> spirit. Well, he is very clear that having a Catholic spirit doesn't mean accepting all kinds of views, okay? Right. There are many beliefs that the scriptures are not as clear about as we might like. 
And there it's like, you know, if your heart is right, as my heart is right, give me your hand. We don't have to agree on every little uh, thing. But he was very clear that there's no give on these grand scriptural doctrines and that nobody should use the idea of can't we all just get along to deny the importance of doctrine. Uh, people should just go and read that sermon and you will get a very different feel from, um, you know, what uh, people tell you it means. As for um, coming apart, the, the problem is that the United Methodist Church is a failed experiment. What was written mm. into our, our way of doing theology from the very beginning was a wrong understanding of what's referred to as the Westry, uh, Wesleyan quadrilateral. Right, right. Where it said, how will we make theological uh, decisions? We'll use scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. And what was not clearly uh, delineated is that scripture is primary and that uh, reason, tradition, and experience are here to help us understand scripture, but yes. not to override it. And so now uh, what has gotten woven into the fabric of United Methodism is that if our reason knows better than scripture, we go with reason. If our experience is different from scripture, then we can go with experience. Right. Um, you know, if, if the traditions of the church um, become such that they now are different than scripture, that's a valid way of doing theology, of doing uh, life. So uh, it's really a wrong-headed approach to look at a denomination that was fatally flawed the way that it was put together at the beginning and say, oh, you know, um, now that you want to separate, you, you're going against this great spirit of uh, unity. Uh, at some points, and I don't mean this quite as um, baldly as it sounds, Jesus said he came to bring division, right? So there's more to just, well, you should always work uh, for unity. When he prayed for unity, it was, you know, sanctify them by your truth, that same right. approach. It was like, we're not going to sacrifice truth for unity, because if we do, we know we'll end up uh, with neither. Uh, Paul wow. talks about, you know, you can't sit down at tables with those who are worshiping uh, false gods and pretend that we're all together. You know, what, what does light have to do with darkness? So, yeah, light and darkness separate. Yes. And when there's darkness in the church, um, you can try to correct it, you can try to bring light to it. But when those who are in authority are promoting darkness, what you don't do is just embrace it and act like it doesn't right. matter. You say, if I can't change it, then I can't be a part. I can't be a part of a church that allows right. its uh, pastors and bishops to deny the divinity of Jesus right, or to right. deny that the scriptures are God's word or to deny right. that Jesus died for our sins. If I've got to be united to you, look, if you think we're better together because uh, if we allow heresy in the church, if you think we're better together with that, yeah, yeah, stay in the United Methodist Church. You're going to do just fine. They may even let you teach seminary courses because <laughs> that is what's being taught in our United Methodist yeah. seminaries. But you're not going to work in the global Methodist church because in the global Methodist church, we worship Jesus Christ as the savior of the world and the Lord of all. Yes. We believe his name is the name given among men whereby we must be saved. We believe he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by him. And if that doesn't work for you, God bless you. There are a lot of places right. you can go be in a church, but the global Methodist church will not be for you because we are about Jesus Christ and everything that the scriptures teach about him. Amen. Just keep, keep, keep going in that same uh, uh, realm of thought or that direction because it's actually a positive time. This is a yeah. great moment where there's like, you're no longer going to be in a position. And this is my encouragement to those who are joining the uh, global Methodist church is that no longer are you part of a church where you you have to affirm that, oh, you have to make excuses. Well, I know we have a lesbian bishop over here, or I know there's a, this yeah. seminary that's teaching witchcraft, but like yeah. this is a great moment. So give us that positive word about what's coming um, for the Methodist yeah. Church, and then we'll, we'll finish up. I have one more question after that. 
Okay, well, yeah, it is a very exciting time. And, uh, you know, the people that are leading the Global Methodist Church, many of them, interestingly, are church planners. Awesome. Uh, that we're not trying to recreate the United Methodist Church just with better doctrine. Uh, there, this is an exciting time because this is a spirit-led and anointed movement that wants to reach people for Christ. Amen. Um, the, the president of the Global Methodist Church, Keith Boyette, an attorney who was called in the ministry, church planner. Uh, Carolyn Moore, who's the head of the WCA that gave birth uh, to the uh, Global Methodist Church, church planners, others are. We have already a hundred people who've told Keith, I want to plant a global Methodist Praise uh, the Lord. church. Yeah, so this this is going to be a great movement. And the truth is that um, even in the most progressive areas, when you combine grace and truth and preach the gospel, it, um, it changes people. The gospel is yes. still real. God's power is still alive. The truth still convicts. And if it is shared by people who are living it out with grace, uh, what can only be found in Jesus continues to speak to the depths of the human heart and bring people to faith in God. Amen. Oh, I love it. Well, Rob, I always ask a question at the end, and it's the title of my podcast is more to the story. And, and I use that because I want to go deeper in a subject than we can get in just a quick kind of soundbite. Yeah. Um, but also it's a theological concept that there's more to the story of salvation than just getting right. your sins forgiven. There's the sanctifying grace of Jesus that's right. available for us and that the yeah. work God wants to do in our life. So there's that side, but it also, uh, is there more to the story of Rob Renfro? Something that you don't get to share because you're generally talking about these type of things. Like is there something uh, you like to do. Uh, well, you know, the, the, we just, uh, got back from a great, uh, trip, uh, to Maine. We mm. have a favorite place in the world called Ure, uh, Colorado. It's the Southwestern corner of Colorado that we think is very, very special. It's near Telluride. The joke is all the billionaires are kicking the millionaires out of Telluride and they're all moving. All the millionaires are now kicking everybody else out of Ure. It's just this beautiful little town, 7,700 feet. Uh, uh, and uh, we've been there at least a dozen times. So you're one of those but, billionaires? Uh, you'd like to be a donor of Wesley Biblical Seminary? <laughs> I think okay. you misunderstood what I said, bro. <laughs> so, uh, but this year we did something different. We went to Bar Harbor, um, Maine. Okay. And we spent a week there. Uh, it's been 100 degrees here practically every day. One day it got up to 70 degrees in oh my uh, Bar Harbor. Yeah. So if we start off in the mornings in the 40s or the 50s, and the hiking there is easier, okay? okay. It's, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. I recommend it. Uh, Katy National Park is fantastic. Okay. But um, then uh, here's the more to the story. So we had this great week there. We're coming home on the plane. There's a guy seated in front of me that is coughing his head off, okay? I'm saying, oh, dear God, please, not COVID. Let the guy have bronchitis or something like that, God, <laughs> but not COVID. And sure enough, two days later, my son says, I got COVID. I got oh. tested. I had COVID. My wife had COVID. So that was the rest of the story for our uh, vacation. But we were done with it in less than a week and none of us got terribly sick. So that's just my that's family. Little... You talk about the Southwest uh, Colorado. We just did a huge trip. We went to up through South Dakota, Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone, then came down through Salt Lake City. And we didn't even know it, but we drove right by Arches National Park. So oh, cool. is that in the same? And so we stopped there for just a little bit. No, different place. Yeah. Oh, different. Okay, gotcha. South, not yeah. that South. Far south this west. is near Durango, tell your ride. Okay. And um, anyhow, try it out sometime. It's, Absolutely. Uh, URA is referred to as the uh, Switzerland uh, of America. Wow. And uh, quaint, beautiful little town. If you love hiking, I, I don't know how you can do better. Awesome. That is great. Well, Rob, just know of uh, like from, from my set, from me personally, but Wesley Biblical Seminary, our appreciation for you mm -hmm. and the work that Good News is doing and our encouragement to Global Methodist Church and those who are disaffiliating, you know, continue to contend for the faith. We, we trust that God has, God's spirit is at work yeah. in this movement and we just trust that. And so, Rob, thank you so much for the work that you've done. I know that you take a lot of heat, um, but know that you're appreciated and we thank God for your courage. Thanks so much for letting me be on here. It's great visiting with you and God bless you and all those who are listening.